It's Monday, the 10th of October. This is a Politics Live special with coverage of Nicola Sturgeon's speech to the SNP conference in Aberdeen. Joining me this afternoon, the SNP MP, John Nicholson. And we're expecting Nicola Sturgeon to get to her feet in about 10 minutes' time. On this, the final day of the party's annual conference. Here's the scene in the hall at the moment. The First Minister will say that Scotland would establish a sustainable economy based on renewable energy if it becomes independent. Thank you. Thank you. And that her plan shows how in an independent Scotland we can deliver lower energy prices and stronger security of supply. We will show, she'll say, how we can break with the low productivity, high inequality, Brexit-based UK economy. Quite a mouthful there, uh, John Nicholson. Anyway, we're thinking she's going to be taken to her feet in about 10 minutes' time. There'll be various right, introductory speeches beforehand. Now, we'll come on to the green economy based on renewables in just a moment. But first of all, let's talk about that promise of a second independence referendum, the date of which is the 19th of October next year. She says she's confident it will take place. Um, what's that confidence based on? Well, she knows that she won a whopping great mandate from the Scottish people at the last Scottish parliamentary elections. And what was interesting about it was that all the political parties understood what those elections were about because the Scottish Conservatives, the Scottish Labour Party said, if you vote today for the SNP, you're voting for an independence referendum. So the opposition parties were clear. Yep. It was in the SNP's manifesto that if there was an SNP majority, uh, there, would be, um, uh, there would be a second referendum on Scottish independence. So she knows she's got the Scottish people behind her. Social Attitude Survey, which is, you know, is the gold mm, standard mm. Uh, of, of polling, um, shows 55% of people now supporting independence. Ah, so the polls are important uh, now well, to, to the SNP. Up, to, uh, up, to, a, up uh, to a point, you and I both know, we've both covered politics ourselves. Yes. We both know that politicians and journalists are absolutely obsessed by polls. I read polls, uh, you read polls. They're not always accurate. Unless they're in favour of what you are actually proposing. Well, that's because a very you know, cynical thing well, to well, say. Well, cynical, sure. but perhaps true, because actually, John Nicholson, as you know, uh, the polls over the last few years have broadly said that Scotland is split 50-50 yes, on, on the issue of having a referendum. So when you say that the people of Scotland are behind you, the SNP, Nicola Sturgeon, in terms of holding that second independence referendum, it, it just isn't the case. They Those, are split well, and yes. uh, a recent poll has very clearly um, said that actually there is a majority against having a second independence referendum anytime soon, within the next few years. So that's the mandate as you see it, as you have clearly set out. But we're In not terms... governed by polls. We're governed by political parties who put their case to the electorate at the time of elections. Now, it was very clear in the SNP's manifesto that if you elect yes. the SNP government, right. we will hold a referendum, and people went out and voted for that. Right. In terms of practically, um, what could stop Nicola Sturgeon holding uh, that second referendum next year? Well, she's determined, quite rightly, to go ahead and hold the referendum. So, previously, as you know, last time round, when there was a majority in the Scottish Parliament mm. uh, for a referendum. The UK government behaved sensibly. We organised a referendum. It was calm, it was mm. cooperative, and we held it uh, with agreement. It was the gold standard. This time round, uh, the Westminster government is being petulant Well, and, that's because they saw silly. it as a once-in-a-generation. I don't want to rehearse the arguments about what but is meant by once-in-a-generation. But if generation. you say that, it's important to remember, it was a throwaway line uh, at the last election Boris a Johnson... A throwaway line? The last election Boris Johnson said that it was a once-in-a-generation general election. He did not mean there would never be another general election. The Edinburgh Agreement, I, well, which was the agreement on which the referendum was based, accepted that Scotland could in the future hold yeah. another referendum. But Nicola Sturgeon has said she doesn't want to hold an unlawful 
independence referendum. And it would be unlawful to hold a referendum unless there is a Section 30, what we call a Section 30 order from Westminster, which provides the legal instrument for granting Holyroot the power to organise a vote. And they have said no. So now this is a case that's been brought to the Supreme Court starting on Tuesday. And if they reject it, as certainly Alba seemed to think, so Kenny McCaskill has said, uh, in the wake of the expected defeat in don't the Supreme Court... I think Alba are really uh, constitutional court. experts, well, aren't they? Well, well, you can say that. Um, in the wake of the expected defeat in the Supreme Court, but at least they are raising the idea that it may well be rejected. What will you do then? Well, I mean, for, first of all, with all due respect to Kenny McCaskill and the Alapa uh, party, they're, they're MPs just like the rest of sure. us. They're not legal experts. I know he's a solicitor, but they're not legal experts or constitutional experts. Mm. I have no idea okay. how the court is going but to rule. you must have thought, obviously, what of will happen, because it's going to be it. over in a couple of, of days. So what is the next it. stage? Well, the fallback position, as the First Minister has said, is that the next election, if ah. that happens, mm. should be fought on the basis of, um, of, 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 of independence. Now, this is not what we want. We don't want to fight an election on this basis. Joe, we are told all the time that this is a union of equals. It is a voluntary union. Mm. Now, we're all entitled to campaign against independence or for independence. That's perfectly legitimate. Mm. But what is not legitimate is for people to stand in the way of Scotland's right to secede if it wants to recede. And of course, if the unionist parties believed for one moment that they were going to win this referendum, they'd be desperate to hold it. But we've already discussed the point that actually we don't know if there are a majority of people who would like to have that second independence let's find referendum. Out. So let's say the Supreme Court reject the idea of it being lawful. Would you counsel Nicola Sturgeon to press ahead anyway? I would, I would say to Nicola Sturgeon to do exactly what she said she oh. will do. To use the to general the election. election uh, on the, on well, the basis of this. And indeed, can, Mrs. Just, can I just say, Mrs yeah. Thatcher, um, for those of us with a long political memory, yeah. used to well, say that, me, that a majority of SNP MPs elected in the House of Commons would constitute a mandate for Scottish independence. So it's not a radical thing. It's mm -hmm. something that Mrs Thatcher, of all people, used to argue so, would, would mean Scottish independence. Well, take our viewers through that process. We have a general election. Let's say it's 2024. So Nicola Sturgeon would already, on the basis, if indeed this is what happens, the Supreme Court says it's not lawful to hold it uh, from Holyrood. We have the 2024 general election and the SNP wins a majority. Again, um, then does Nicola Sturgeon stand up and say Scotland is independent the day after? That's it. Independent Scotland. Let's see. Uh, well, hang on, what does that mean? Well, we're not at that stage yet. Well, so I, th I, think what we, I think what we need to do is go through this process in a you know, calm, uh, logical fashion. Mm. I mean, our opening position is we want the government to accept the mandate of the Scottish Parliament. Yeah, Parliament. but we've done that. So we're, we're moving we, down we then, we, we yeah. then move yeah. on to the Supreme Court. Yeah. That is where we are at the moment. I know. So if you, if you don't mind, I'm not going to predict what well, happens... After I'm, not a, I'm not asking you to predict. I'm asking you to explain what Nicola Sturgeon has already clearly set out, which is, as you say, she's going to use the next general election as a referendum on Scottish independence. So I ask you, just translate that for us, interpret that for us. Does that mean if the SNP wins in 24, the First Minister will declare Scotland an independent country? I, I think the political situation will change dramatically if that happens because I talk to a lot of MPs cross party mm -hmm. and the thing that I find and I find this with my constituents as well even amongst people who don't support Scottish independence they support the right of Scotland to be independent I think that was why there was so much anger and I'm talking about anger from uh, Tory party voters in my constituency about the way that Liz Truss spoke in the course of her election campaign because nobody wants the First Minister or Scotland Scottish democracy to be disrespected. And I think cross-party mm. people believe that Scotland has the right to be independent yes. and uh, parties should fight on the, on the, on the politics yeah. of it rather than the principle of whether Scotland has the right to withdraw from what we are told repeatedly mm. is a voluntary union. No, I mean, it's absolutely clear the where's and why for's from your perspective and from Nicola Sturgeon's and the party as a whole in terms of wanting that second independence referendum and wanting it to be lawful and accepted and for the government to say yes to it to going ahead. But none of these things 
may happen. And so I come back to what we do know from Nicola Sturgeon. And what it sounds like, potentially, is that she's running out of options and running out of road. And that the pressure is coming now on her to press ahead if all of the legal obstacles are still in place by next year. In every single country, and we hear this all the time from politicians across the political spectrum, believe in the right of countries to self-determination. I have never heard... But people say they've had that. I've... Scotland has had that right but, but, and they lost. But, demo but d democracy is not a one-day process. But it was only 2014. It, 20, 20, 24, I mean, this is, this is just eight, eight years you later. You Margaret Thatcher. I mean, history, as you know, you know is... It, it, well, we have elections every four years, sometimes election every well, two years, two because years people are entitled to change their mind. That's the nature of democracy. Now, if you were a 15-year-old uh, who wasn't able to vote at the last uh, referendum, you're now in your mid-20s. And you don't want to listen to people telling you that your parents had their democracy, so you're not entitled to have your democracy. It, evol it evolves. And we know this is a passion in particular for, for young people. And I would say to unionist politicians, if they think that the union is worth having, mm. fight for it, defend it, argue uh, for it. Don't say you're not entitled to express your view on it. What about the relationship between Liz Truss and Nicola Sturgeon? I mean, it's only just begun, although Liz Truss has been in the Cabinet uh, under several Conservative administrations. Um, we had that remark yesterday from Nicola Sturgeon. We discussed it earlier on today. Uh, the, I she, thought you she, might. Yeah, funnily enough. Um, I detest Tories and everything they stand for, and yet I want to work constructively uh, with the UK Prime Minister. Those, those two comments don't really stack up, do they? Well, I, I think, and, and she's clarified her comments and what she said. She it, said was, it, it she was too strong. Detest, wasn't it? Detest, she detests Tory policies. She detests yeah. the effect that Tory no, that's policies not what she have said. on the. On the I'm not, I know what she said. Mm. Uh, she's clarified her comments. And, you know, you know my style of politics. I think it's good to argue uh, 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 about the issues uh, rather than about the people. And I, I think Nicola Sturgeon has made it clear that she was talking about the issues. That's what she intended to say, mm. rather than uh, being unkind uh, about, uh, certainly about Tory voters or even about Tory politicians. But there's been a bit of pearl clutching about all of this and a bit of faux outrage. Um, you know, Liz Truss is the person who was going around in the election campaign saying that she thought that Nicola Sturgeon was an attention seeker. This the, by the MP who wanders around with a professional photographer wherever she goes. Um, and she said that she thought she was an attention seeker and was best ignored. That wasn't very courteous, was it? So how do you think they're going to get along? I don't know. I've not been in the room uh, with, the, with the two of them. Um, I understand Liz Truss is, is very keen to, um, to be in vogue. Uh, and the First Minister has been in the magazine twice. So I, I believe she asked some advice about how to get into vogue. So maybe they, they might bond over that and who knows where that and will take them. Well, let's uh, take us to Aberdeen. Uh, David Wallace Lockhart, my colleague, is there. Hello to you. What's happening? So, Joe, that is the... Uh, well, the reason it's so quiet here is because the conference hall itself is now packed out, of course, this being uh, the, the, the main event of conference, Nicola Sturgeon's keynote speech, which will close the conference shortly. We've had a few hints about what she's going to say. We, you know, your discussion there with John Nicholson really did paint a picture of a UK and Scottish government who are not exactly seeing eye to eye at the moment. And Nicola Sturgeon will accuse Liz Truss, we suspect, of, of denying democracy as she sees it by not uh, willing to be willing to countenance that idea of a second independence referendum at the moment. But Nicola Sturgeon, we actually expect, will say that she believes independence would be the route to improving relations across the UK, essentially saying that then it would be two equal countries in her view, rather than, as she calls it, muscular unionism. We'll hear, I'm sure, about independence, but ahead of that Supreme Court case that will start being heard tomorrow, um, there's not really any sort of new tactics or, or new strategies I think we'll get in this uh, speech from Nicola Sturgeon. It, it's mainly going to be big picture stuff. And I think we'll hear quite a lot of the speech focused on energy. Now, historically, the SNP put a lot of stock in oil and what that could do for Scotland, like Many places around the world, the discussion has moved on a bit in Scotland and we're talking a lot about renewables and uh, Nicola Sturgeon is likely to argue that with the powers of independence, she believes that not only could Scotland uh, improve its energy security when it comes to supply through renewables, but that Scots would also be seeing cheaper bills.
David Wallace Lockhart, thank you very much for that. Um, I don't know if we can go into the hall in a few minutes' time. Um, Nicola Sturgeon running perhaps five minutes behind schedule, fashionably uh, late. Uh, Kirsten Oswald, the deputy uh, leader in Westminster, has been directing events leading up to her taking to her feet. Um, you were saying people can change their minds. People do change their minds. Of course they do, uh, in everything. And, well, let's uh, trust it. She was a ferocious <laughs> opponent of, of Brexit and is now a, a passionate Brexiteer. But let's, let's trust was advising people to go off and fight in the Ukraine, if you remember, from the United Kingdom, and then suddenly discovered that that would be illegal and changed her mind on, on that. These are pretty dramatic reversals well, and from another the current one, Prime Minister. And another one is on the issue, as David Wallace Lockhart was talking about, it is on the issue of green energy, renewables, uh, we are expecting uh, the first minister to talk about that would actually sustain an independent Scotland, the economy of an independent Scotland. Well, how times have changed because, of course, the economic prospectus in 2014, John Nicholson, was that oil would be vital to the future economy of an independent Scotland. Except we still don't know for sure whether Nicola Sturgeon and the SNP in an independent Scotland would oppose outright any new gas or oil licences or exploration in the North Sea, should they? I think it's important for viewers to know that at the moment, this is not something that the Scottish Government has control over. It's a Westminster uh, government area. But we're talking about an Post-independence. Post what the First Minister has said, I think, is that she's predisposed not to agree to new oil and gas fields because of environmental reasons. And that they would have to meet, meet very stringent environmental Tests. But that means she so, wouldn't. She wouldn't reject them outright. She might entertain the idea of gas and oil exploration. I, I think reading the room and reading Nicola Sturgeon talking about this, it's pretty clear that for all the reasons we heard about at the COP26 conference, uh, she would not be predisposed uh, towards this. But it's very important to learn the lessons from the way in which the mining communities were handled, for example, and ah. to, to transition, uh, mindful of the effect that it has, not only in the local economy, but in the people who work in those industries. And we've got a second chance, don't we? Because we didn't make best use of oil in Scotland, uh, given that we sent the revenues um, to, to Westminster. We now have fantastic renewable resources. We already uh, cover our entire electricity use by what we generate in Scotland. So, so this is a wonderful new clean energy source. Uh, and it's going to be a wonderful opportunity for an independent Scotland. Yes, but, I mean, are you really minded, uh, if there were to be an independent Scotland, to actually go 100% for that sustainable green Scotland? Friends of the Earth have said very clearly any oil and gas exploration is incompatible um, with the climate. You would agree? I would agree, and it's clearly a declining uh, resource, and uh, we, we, we know how vital it is uh, for our planet's future that we don't burn fossil fuels. So the direction of travel is blindingly clear. Well, let's have a look. As you say, um, it, it would have an impact, wouldn't it, to not go ahead with any future oil and gas exploration or even reduce it in any way. I mean, oil and gas supports around 100,000 jobs in Scotland. That's an awful lot of jobs. It is, and there's, there's major transition funding happening mm. at the moment. And I suspect that we might hear something more from the First Minister uh, now in this speech coming up about transitional funding and exactly how it would apply for oil and gas workers. Because oh. it's an important... Uh, important factor for consideration. Are you torn over this issue? I mean, it, it isn't easy, is it, for the SNP who did want oil as the basis of any independent Scotland in the past. Now you have your partners in government, uh, the Greens. Is that the reason that minds have changed politically? No, I think we, we all know it's... We all, we've all learned the environmental lessons, but I think when historians come to write about this period, they will think it remarkable when they look at the two countries that found oil at the same time in the Atlantic. We had the, the Norwegians and the Scots. Norway now perhaps the wealthiest country in the world per, per capita with the largest sovereign oil fund. And we look at Scotland. Uh, the UK uh, was responsible for our oil uh, wealth and what was done with it. And the Norwegians, of course, were independent and chose their own future. I, I think historians will gauge that the Norwegians uh, did rather better. How, how are these... Oh, I might just pause there. I think we're going to go into the hall. They're on their feet. That's Keith um, Brown. It is, the deputy leader. And here is Nicola Sturgeon, the First Minister.
My friends, it is so good to be speaking at conference in person again, rather than just virtually. <laughs> Getting to hug friends and colleagues is so, so much better. Our political family, Scotland's biggest party by far, is back together again, and that feels great. Now, the only downside of not being on Zoom is having to trade my slippers for these heels. <laughs> but I suppose I can't have absolutely everything. Of course, it is always good to be here in Aberdeen, especially, especially now that the SNP is once again leading this great city. Aberdeen and the North East is at the heart of our just transition to a net zero future. Since our late Queen, whose extraordinary life of service we have honoured in recent weeks, switched on the 40s pipeline in 1975, oil and gas has powered the Scottish economy. Her late Majesty back then inaugurated the oil and gas age as we move now, in so many ways, into a new era, we have a duty to repay all those who work in that industry. A duty... <clears throat> a duty to support them into new jobs in green energy. An opportunity to usher in the new age of Scottish renewables. Conference, Aberdeen is the oil and gas capital of Europe. Let us resolve today to now make it the net zero capital of the world. <clears throat> that ambition led us to establish the £500 million Just Transition Fund for this region. Today, I can announce the first 22 projects have just been awarded funding of more than £50 million. <clears throat> These projects will support the production of green hydrogen, the development of wave and tidal technology, and even pioneer the use of waste from whisky to recycle EV batteries. They will focus on the skills our existing workforce need to take advantage of the renewables revolution. Incredible Scottish ingenuity here in the North East, supported by the Scottish Government, developing technologies to tackle the global climate emergency. It is exciting inspiring stuff and it is a shining example of what a Scottish Government can do when the powers lie in our hands. <clears throat> Conference, when we last gathered together, just weeks from the start of a global pandemic, we could not have imagined what lay ahead. Thankfully, COVID no longer dominates the news or our thoughts quite as much as it did. But the virus still poses a risk, especially as we approach winter. So before I go any further today, a plea. If you are eligible, get your booster jag. Vaccination is just as important now as it was last winter. If you don't do it for yourself, though you really, really should, do it for those more vulnerable than you. And please do it for the National Health Service. We owe the NHS and all who work in it a massive debt of gratitude.
conference, all of us hoped that when the worst of the pandemic was over, better times would lie ahead. Thanks to the brilliance of vaccine scientists and the sheer strength of the human spirit, I am certain those better days will come. But in the midst of a cost of living crisis, it won't surprise you to hear me talk today about the challenges we face and about the massive responsibility of me and my government to help you through it. As we navigate these stormy waters, Scotland needs a steady and compassionate hand on the tiller. Conference, that is what our Scottish Government provides. <laughs> but today, I will also make the case for optimism. For not just accepting the world as it is, but turning our minds and our hearts instead to building a stronger Scotland and playing our part in building a better, fairer world. The optimism that a better world is possible is inspired for me by the bravery of those who endure the toughest of times. And at home, by the knowledge that this beautiful, magnificent country of ours is bursting with talent, creativity, and ingenuity. We also have a sense of solidarity and common purpose that, yes, our political debate can sometimes obscure. Conference, Scotland has got what it takes to be a successful, independent country. It has it in abundance. Never let anyone tell us otherwise. Of course, at this moment, across the world, that better future can be hard to see, eclipsed as it is by significant and profound challenges. A war of unprovoked aggression on our continent, an energy price crisis and soaring inflation, democratic norms eroded and human rights attacked in too many countries. In the face of that, we have a duty to champion progressive values and universal rights. Friends, that is a duty our party will always discharge. <laughs> but in the UK, we have a Westminster government intent on taking us down a different path. The current Home Secretary speaking at the Conservative Party conference, said this about asylum seekers. And even as I quote her, I struggle to comprehend that she actually said these words. But here they are. I would love to be having a front page of the Telegraph with a plane taking off to Rwanda. That's my dream, it's my obsession. Conference, my dream is very different. I'm sure it is shared in this hall and by the vast majority across Scotland. My dream is that we live in a world where those fleeing violence and oppression are shown compassion and treated like human beings, not shown the door and bundled onto planes like unwanted cargo. Friends, our case for hope and optimism rests above all on our common humanity, compassion, solidarity, love. These values sustained us in the darkest days of the pandemic. They must drive us forward now. Those fighting across the globe for democracy, equality and human dignity must hear that they are not alone. So let the message go out from us 
to everyone across the world standing up against tyranny and oppression. We stand with you. To women in Iran fighting for basic human rights, we stand with you. To girls, to girls in Afghanistan demanding the right to go to school, we stand with you. To men and women risking their lives in opposition to Putin in Russia or his sidekick in Belarus, we stand with you. And to the people of Ukraine fighting for your very existence, we stand with you. Today, we live on a continent where a so-called strong man, the one who has never looked weaker or more insecure, has launched a brutal invasion of his neighbour. That should be unimaginable in 21st century Europe. But for the people of Ukraine, it is all too real. Every day, there are atrocities and killings. Today, the capital Kyiv and cities across the country are under renewed bombardment. Despicable war crimes have been committed. And conference, let us be clear. These are war crimes for which Vladimir Putin must be held to account. The contrast between Putin and the people of Ukraine could not be starker. From President Zelensky to the sacrifice of ordinary citizens, personified here on Saturday by our guest, Lesia Vasilenko, we have seen incredible bravery and extraordinary determination. Ukraine, you are an inspiration to the world and we will always stand with you. Conference, we are not on the front line of this war, but Ukraine's victory in the battle between democracy and tyranny is vital for all of us. The Scottish Government will continue to do everything we can to help. We are helping enforce sanctions and isolate Russia. We have provided funds for vital military equipment, and we have opened Scotland's doors to those displaced. Initially, we committed to welcoming 3,000 people seeking refuge from the war. I am pleased to say that we are now providing safety for more than 20,000. <laughs> to each and every one, our hearts go out to you. We know you yearn to go home, but for as long as you need a place of sanctuary, be in no doubt, you have a home here in Scotland. <laughs> Conference, there are moments in history, as now with Ukraine, when all of us must be prepared to make sacrifices to help defend fundamental freedoms. But when global turbulence strikes, National governments have a duty to act in ways that mitigate rather than exacerbate the impacts on their own populations. When it comes to the cost of living crisis and so much else besides, this UK government is utterly failing in that duty. <laughs> 
Each and every day, its actions are making matters worse. We last gathered together as a party in October 2019. Back then, the Tories had just elected a new leader. Westminster was in meltdown. A new Prime Minister was driving through a disastrous policy agenda despite warnings of its dire economic impact. And here we are, all over again. Another spin on the Tory misery go round. But this time, this time the carousel is speeding up. It took the Tories three years, three long years, to realise that Boris Johnson was a disaster. With Liz Truss, it took them just three weeks. She caused mayhem in the markets with her decision to borrow billions of pounds to fund tax cuts for the richest. Borrowing to be repaid by eye-watering austerity cuts and a raid on the incomes of the poorest. It is unconscionable. The Prime Minister's justification is that she is going for growth. Conference, let me tell you what kind of growth that will be. Growth in the gap between rich and poor. Growth in the rates of poverty. Growth in the pressure on our NHS and other public services. And without any doubt, growth in the deep disgust that the public feel for all of it. The truth is, massive handouts for the wealthiest at the expense of everyone else do nothing for the economy. All they do is turbocharge inequality. So let me be clear about this. No SNP government will ever inflict on Scotland such an immoral, self-defeating disaster of a policy. We will continue to use our powers and resources to help those most in need, and not as an act of charity, but in our collective interest. Conference, here is what I stand for, what we stand for. Not hoping, against all evidence to the contrary, that wealth will suddenly and magically start trickling down, but instead lifting people up so they can contribute their full potential. That is the SNP's founding principle for a stronger economy. I am proud of the work the Scottish Government is doing to tackle child poverty. The Scottish child payment is unique in the United Kingdom. It is paid to eligible families with children up to age six. It started at £10 per week. At conference last year, I announced we would double it to 20. Friends, five weeks from today, we will increase it again to £25 a week. Vital financial help for more than 100,000 children delivered in time for Christmas. On the same day we increase the payment, we will also extend it to families with children up to age 16. Now, conference. I, I know I'm a bit biased, but I think that's a sign of a government with the right priorities. But we need, we need to do more, because we know this winter is going to be really tough. Rather than looking forward to Christmas, too many families will be dreading it. Dreading it because they don't know if they can afford to heat their homes or even pay for food. 
As part of our help to the poorest families over the past year, we have made quarterly bridging payments of £130. These have gone to children and young people in receipt of free school meals but who don't qualify for the child payment. Today, I can announce that the final instalment ahead of the extension of the child payment and due in the next few weeks will not be £130. We will double it to £260. <laughs> That will help put food on the Christmas table for families of 145,000 children and young people. Now, I don't pretend it will make all of their worries go away. No government with our limited powers can ever do that. But I do hope this investment of almost £20 million will bring a bit of Christmas cheer to those who need it most. Conference, we have used the powers of our Parliament to deliver the unique child payment. Last Thursday, we took further action to help combat the cost of living crisis. The Scottish Government's emergency bill to protect tenants was passed by Parliament. The result, a rent freeze in operation in Scotland over the winter until at least the end of March next year. But as we have acted to help those in need, what about the UK government? You know, it is difficult to overstate the calamity of their actions. Back in 2014, the Westminster establishment told us that it was the UK's standing in the world, its economic strength and its stability that made independence impossible. Now they say it's the UK's isolation, its weakness and instability, the very conditions they created that means change can't happen. As far as Westminster is concerned, it's heads they win and tails we lose, but this time it will not wash. Because what that is delivering for Scotland is this. Brexit, more austerity, homeowners facing real hardship and hundreds of thousands in poverty. Conference, that is not strength and stability. It is chaos and catastrophe. And friends, all of that is on the Tories. But we should remember that their ability to do it has too often been aided and abetted by Labour. In 2014, Labour joined forces with the Tories. They said then that Westminster Tory government was better for Scotland than self-government. And incredibly, they're doing it all over again. It wasn't easy to understand back then, but given everything that has happened since, it is utterly inexplicable now. <clears throat> Take Brexit, imposed on Scotland against our will and doing real lasting damage to our interests, our economy and our young people. Labour is now just as committed to Brexit, a hard Brexit, as the Tories. You know, at least the Tories believe in it. Labour doesn't. <laughs> Yet rather than make the principled argument, which they could actually now win in England, they cower away from it. They abandon all principle for fear of upsetting the apple cart. Bluntly, they are willing to chuck Scotland under Boris Johnson's Brexit bus to get the keys to Downing Street. 
friends. Letting down Scotland, same old Labour. For Scotland, there is a fundamental democratic issue here, and it has real life consequences. Whether it's Tory or Labour, Labour or Tory, it's not us who gets to decide. Our votes don't determine who gets to occupy number 10. For Scotland, the problem is not just which party is in power at Westminster, the problem is Westminster. And to fix that, to make sure we get the governments that the largest number of us vote for, always, not just occasionally. For that, my friends, we need Scotland's independence. Independence is not a panacea for any nation, but it is about hope for a better future. We all want Scotland to be a country in which no child goes to bed hungry, a place where everyone can afford to heat their home, where our vast energy resources benefit all who live here and help save the planet. None of that should be radical but it must be the foundation of everything we aspire to. For as long, for as, long as I am First Minister, and by the way, conference, I intend that to be for quite some time yet. <laughs> My job, our job, is not done. For as long as I am First Minister, I will do everything in my power to build the better Scotland we all want to see. Now, I know some people ask, and it is not an illegitimate question, why propose a referendum in the midst of a cost of living crisis? Conference, the answer is in the question. The answer is the cost of living crisis. It is, it is the Tory response to it, it is the financial chaos and it is the damage of Brexit. All of that is laying bare each and every single day the harm being done to people in Scotland because we are not independent. Now, over the next two days, the Supreme Court will consider whether the current law allows the Scottish Parliament to legislate for an advisory referendum. If Westminster had any respect at all for Scottish democracy, this court hearing would not be necessary. But Westminster has no such respect. That means this issue was always destined to end up in court sooner or later. Better, in my view, that it is sooner. If the court decides, 
If the court decides in the way we hope it does, on 19th October next year, there will be an independence referendum. And if the court doesn't decide that way, well, first and obviously, we will respect that judgment. We believe in the rule of law. And as a party and a movement, we will, of course, reflect. But fundamentally, it will leave us with a very simple choice. Put our case for independence to the people in an election or give up on Scottish democracy. Conference, I don't know about you. Actually, I suspect I do know about you. But I will never, ever give up on Scottish democracy. For now, the question of process, the how of securing independence, is in the hands of judges. But it is for us to crack on with answering the question, why? Polls last week show that support for independence is rising. But remember, polls are just momentary snapshots in time. They go up and they go down. Much more significant are the findings of the latest British Social Attitude Survey. Ten years ago, support for independence was at 23%. Five years ago, 45%. Now, in that gold standard measure of public opinion, support for independence stands at 52%. <laughs> As we know, it is even higher amongst young people. So it is tempting sometimes to assume an inevitability about independence, that the arc of history is moving firmly in its direction. I hope and believe that will turn out to be true. But we would be wrong, utterly wrong, to take it for granted. Our job is to make the case and win the argument. That means... That means not just talking to ourselves, but reaching out to others not yet persuaded. I remember in the 2014 campaign, speaking at a public meeting in Leith, it was jam-packed. So busy, in fact, that the organisers asked those who had already decided to vote yes to leave, so that those still undecided could hear the arguments. That is the approach I want us to take now, though for the avoidance of doubt, I am not asking you to get up and leave. <laughs> but I do want us to resolve today that from here on we will speak less to each other and more to those outside our ranks. <clears throat> I know that some watching at home right now will never be persuaded to vote yes. You oppose independence as strongly and from as much principle as we support it. I respect that. That is democracy. And please remember, whatever happens in future, Scotland belongs to you as much as it does to us. Scotland belongs to all of us. And for those who want to be convinced but still have questions and doubts, it is our job to persuade, reassure and inspire. Conference, one of the great ironies of the independence debate is that so many of the institutions that people associate with Britishness 
Institutions that have shaped our shared history, like the NHS, a fair social security system, public service broadcasting. The threat to these institutions comes not from an independent Scotland. It comes from UK governments that are dismantling or undermining these institutions. With independence, we can do more to protect them. Let's take one of those institutions, our most precious public service. The NHS is under enormous pressure right now. It delivers outstanding care within waiting time targets for the vast majority of those who need it. Today, I want us to pay tribute to each and every individual who works within our National Health Service. But the pressures on the NHS mean that despite their dedication, too many people are waiting too long. That is why we are delivering record investment. And it is why we are doing everything we can to give our NHS workers a fair pay rise, because conference few in our society deserve it more than they do. Fast diagnosis and reliable quality health care matters whatever your condition. But it is especially important for those with cancer. The best chance of surviving cancer remains early detection and treatment. Over the past year, we have established three new fast-track cancer diagnostic centres in Ayrshire and Arran, Dumfries and Galloway and Fife. They have already supported hundreds of patients more than one in seven were found to have cancer, and around half of them were from the poorest parts of our country. So these centres are helping tackle health inequality too. Conference Fast Track Cancer Diagnosis Centres work. That's why I'm delighted to confirm today that two more centres will open next year, one in the Borders and one in Lanarkshire. And by the end of this Parliament, there will be a fast-track cancer diagnosis centre in every health board in Scotland. That is just one example of how we are supporting our NHS. That job is the most important our government has right now. Management of the NHS is our responsibility. It is no one else's. But the fact is, our ability to fund it properly depends on decisions taken at Westminster. When they cut our budget or when they crash our economy, that makes it harder for us to protect the health service. And if, as some Tories are now openly arguing, they move away from the very basis on which it was founded and towards an insurance-based alternative, that will destroy our National Health Service. With independence, that will never happen. We, we will always protect its founding principles. You know, with independence, we could choose to embed a universal NHS in a written constitution a constitutional right to health care free at the point of need conference. If the SNP is in government, that is exactly what we will do. Some see independence as turning our back on the rest of the UK. It is not. 
It is about recasting our relationship as one of equals. Across these islands, we share history, family connections, and friendships. These things matter just as much to supporters of independence as to anyone else. In fact, I am willing to bet that the nations of these islands will work together even better with independence than we do now. <laughs> Scotland will still be a member of the British Irish Council. The difference is that, like the Republic of Ireland now, we will be there as an independent country. You know, there is a point here that, at first glance, might seem curious. But in my view, it is becoming increasingly true. Independence is actually the best way to protect the partnership on which the United Kingdom was founded, a voluntary partnership of nations. Right now, Right now, and, and make no mistake about this, it is an aggressive unionism that is undermining that partnership. <laughs> Westminster's denial of Scottish democracy, full frontal attacks on devolution, a basic lack of respect. If there is tension, that is what is causing it. It is, it is, my friends, Scottish independence, a new partnership of the Isles that can renew the whole idea of our nations working together for the common good. England, Scotland, Wales, the island of Ireland, we will always be the closest of friends we will always be family, but we can achieve a better relationship, a true partnership of equals when we win Scotland's independence. Conference, I am well aware that what gives many people most pause for thought on independence is the economy. People can see all too clearly now that the UK does not offer economic strength or financial security. And yet, still, and rightly, they want to know that independence will make Scotland's economy stronger, not weaker. That is fair. And especially now, that is entirely understandable. Of course, it is equally fair to point out that so much of the uncertainty and crisis we face is not because of independence. It is the opposite. Once again, it is because we are not independent. Conference. <clears throat> independence is not a miracle economic cure. But let this message ring out today. We can do better than this. We can do so much better than this. And let's remember, let's remember these three basic facts. First, Scotland is not benefiting right now from the so-called broad shoulders of the United Kingdom. <laughs> Second, and let there be no doubt about this, we have got everything it takes to be a successful, independent country. extraordinary resources, industries and talent in abundance. And third, independence is not an untested idea. Independence is normal.
countries of Scotland's size or even smaller, independence is an outstanding success. Earlier this year, the Scottish Government published evidence illustrating that point. Conference, listen now to these facts and then think of the untapped potential Scotland has. Compared to the UK, these other countries with so many similarities to Scotland are wealthier, more equal, they have higher productivity, lower poverty rates, lower child poverty and lower pensioner poverty. They have higher social mobility. They spend more on research and development. They have higher business investment. In short, these countries combine economic dynamism with social solidarity. They are amongst the most successful societies the world has ever known, and it is their success not a failing UK economy that Scotland must now aim to match. <laughs> With independence, we won't emulate that success overnight. But the big burning question is this. If all of these countries can achieve all of that, why not Scotland? <laughs> Conference, I can confirm that one week today we will publish the next in our Building a New Scotland series of papers. It will make the economic case for independence. It will set out how we can build a new sustainable economy based on our massive renewable energy resources. It will show how in an energy rich, independent Scotland, we can deliver lower prices and stronger security of supply. And on energy, let me give this commitment. Unlike our UK counterparts, the Scottish Government will not be issuing licenses for fracking. In the economic prospectus, we will set out how, in an independent Scotland, we can secure fair work. We will repeal Westminster's anti-trade union legislation. We will, end, we will end age discrimination for those on the minimum wage. We will show how businesses can benefit from independence. With EU membership, they'll be back inside the world's biggest single market. With a fairer migration policy and freedom of movement restored, they will have access to workers from Europe and across the world. They will have new opportunities to influence government policy through a social partnership approach. In short, we will show how we can break with the low productivity, high inequality, Brexit-based UK economy and use the full powers of independence to build an inclusive, fair, well-being economy that works for everyone. An economy that works for everyone. That is the prize of independence. Conference, moving to independence and making it work will of course take time, hard work and good judgment. There will be many challenges along the way. Our economic prospectus will be clear on these two. If the past three weeks have taught us anything, it is that a country's fiscal and monetary policy must be sustainable and command confidence. We will not shy away from that. Our approach to borrowing with the new powers of independence will be responsible and for a purpose. Let me give one example of that, a central proposal in the paper we will publish next week. 
We propose to invest remaining oil revenues and use our borrowing powers, not to cut tax for the richest, but to set up an independence investment fund. The Building a New Scotland Fund will deliver up to £20 billion of investment in the first decade of independence. In practical terms, a fund like this could support a massive programme to decarbonise housing, cut fuel bills and reduce fuel poverty. It could finance the building of thousands more affordable homes, invest in local renewable energy projects, helping communities own assets and wield more influence over their use. It will help the transition to net zero, build resilient communities and kickstart the sustainable economic growth so important for our newly independent nation, combining Scotland's abundant resources with the powers of independence to benefit this and future generations. Conference, that is what independence is all about. My friends, a week ago, one of the most famous men in the history of the independence movement, Ian Hamilton, died at the ripe old age of 97. As a young man in 1950, Ian, together with Kay Matheson, Gavin Vernon and Alan Stewart, repatriated the Stone of Destiny from Westminster Abbey. Ian once called it an absolutely splendid adventure. <laughs> I am sure it was that, but it was so much more besides. In 1950, and to be frank, for years afterwards, independence must have seemed like an impossible dream. All of us here today have a big job still to do to win independence. But we no longer face such impossible odds. Friends, we are the independence generation. We are the inheritors of the cause kept alive by Ian Hamilton and his generation. And I believe firmly in my head and in my heart that we will be the first in the modern world to live in an independent Scotland. <laughs> Let me tell you why I say that. A couple of weeks ago, I had a conversation with a woman that summed up a question I think a lot of people have. She said that she would like Scotland to be independent. She thought it would be good, but she also worried that getting there would be hard. So her question was this, is it essential? And that got me thinking. For many people, like Ian, like all of us in this hall, we just believe it is right that Scotland could and should be an independent nation. But is it essential? Conference today, probably more than at any time in my life, the answer to that question is yes. Independence is essential. It is essential to escape Westminster control and mismanagement. Essential to get the governments we vote for, to properly protect our NHS, 
to build a new partnership of equals with the other nations on these islands. It is essential if we want to be back in the European Union. And it is essential if we want the people who live here to determine the future of this extraordinary country. The country that always tugs at our heartstrings. The country that we all care so much about. There are two things that we, the independence generation, must never, ever lose faith in. They have sustained us in good times and bad throughout all the years and decades. First is the fundamental right of the nation of Scotland to self-determination. And the second is what history teaches us, and that is the overwhelming power of democracy to triumph. My friends, the period ahead will see some of the greatest challenges our country has faced in many years. But a great opportunity is also in sight. An opportunity to win and build the better future we know is possible. A better future as an independent nation. Welcoming, diverse, full of love and compassion. In these tough times, let us inspire with hope in our hearts. Let us lift our eyes, put our shoulders to the wheel and build a better future for this and generations to come. Friends, with optimism, confidence and determination, we can now finish the job and we will. Thank you. Cheers and a standing ovation. There were so many of them during that speech that lasted nearly an hour by the First Minister Nicola Sturgeon there. We've heard many of the arguments before, but she demonstrated, perhaps more than I've seen in the last few years, um, a, a determination and a grip on her party, uh, an authority over the SNP as she tries to plot and navigate a way to that so far elusive second independence referendum. The language was about optimism, hope, love, renewal, reaching out to those, she said, who had sincerely held beliefs to remain within the union. Perhaps the first time that she set out quite clearly to try and inspire confidence and reassurance in no voters um, in Scotland that an independent Scotland is not something to fear. And yet, the practical implications of what's going to happen over the next few weeks will still challenge her because she said very clearly that if the Supreme Court over the next few days decide to reject the case and the argument for Holyrood, uh, for the Scottish Government to hold a lawful second referendum, she will respect that judgment. We believe in the rule of law. So Nicola Sturgeon will not go ahead with any second referendum unless it has a legal footing um, and is backed up by the Supreme Court. She's in Aberdeen. Um, where the SNP conference has been held. Part of the economic prospectus for an independent Scotland is no longer oil and gas. She said Aberdeen is the oil and gas capital of Europe, and I want to make it the net zero capital of the world. And she announced, I think we've heard before, um, I'm not sure about the amount, but £500 million for the Just Transition Fund uh, for a greener economy. Well, John Nicholson, you watched it with me here. What did you think? Well, I, I was interested in some of the themes that she pursued. Uh, the fact that she mentioned love twice. I, I don't think I've ever heard a party leader talk about love in a conference speech. And I liked it. Um, I, I thought what a contrast with some of the anger that we saw, for example, at the Conservative Party conference, where you have a Home Secretary who fantasises about 
uh, deporting people and said her dream is to deport people to Rwanda. Or is it the anger also of previous SNP conferences and language and some of the people who've protested over the years? Well, I haven't really heard anger at SNP conferences for a, for a long time. The mood in the SNP has for at least the last 10 years been really optimistic. We know that in 2015 they had this huge electoral breakthrough. But I was interested in the, the love word. I was interested in the way that she talked about Scotland, independent Scotland, as a welcoming country. Again, talking about immigration and welcoming people from overseas. She emphasised the large number of people that Scotland had taken from Ukraine, again, as a, as a theme. And she talked about lifting our eyes to the future. I always think if you want people to vote for you, you have to present an optimistic vision. People aren't attracted to anger, are they? They're attracted to optimism and to ambition. And there was ambition and optimism in spades, I think, in the course of the speech. I was also very interested in the way in which she stretched out to unionists. Mm. She said to some unionists, I know you're never going to uh, vote for independence, but Scotland belongs to all of us. But obviously, her, for her, the prize is that 55% who voted against independence in 2014. She knows that the polls are moving in the right direction. Uh, she knows that young people support independence in, in vast numbers. But she's keen to be inclusive. And I think that's well judged and important. She says the job isn't done yet, and it isn't. She may yet still be prevented from holding that referendum. In that sense, you feel that the, the road is closing in on her a little bit when it comes to the power and the authority to actually hold what she wants to do, which is that second independence referendum. There's two choices for the UK. Uh, one choice is to say that each of the constituent parts of the UK are entitled to remain or to leave mm. as they choose. It's a voluntary union, a union of equals. Or the alternative is to say that it's no longer a voluntary union and that Scotland will be kept in the union against their will. Now, it's up to unionist politicians, I suppose, to try and work out which of those roads that they want to go down. And I certainly don't think the, the, the road of compulsion is an attractive one, nor on, on a, in terms of just political strategy. I don't think it will help them win votes or support. I mean, she said in the interview yesterday on the BBC that um, there was no choice. She, she'd prefer a Labour government at Westminster to a Conservative uh, government. Um, Keir Starmer's Labour Party have been very clear. There will not be any deal or coalition or collaboration on a formal level with the SNP. Yes, he's talked a lot about coalition. He, it's, it's, it's one of these little political slates of hand. He's saying, we will not give you something that you've neither asked for nor want. We do not want a coalition with the Labour Party. There will be no coalition with the Labour Party. We're not going to give them a coalition, no matter how much uh, they support, beg for But you'll support, for you'll support pretty well everything a Labour government would do if they win next time. Yes, but if they, if they want to get... England only legislation through, they're going to have to have some sort of confidence and supply uh, agreement. Uh, I don't know what's happened to Keir Starmer. I've known him for a long time. This is a man who has championed the right of self-determination for countries all across the world. Uh, he used to say it was up to the Scots to decide what their future is. Mm. But now he seems to have transformed into Ian Paisley Jr. I, I don't know where this hardline unionism comes from. I suspect well, maybe he's... maybe it's just unionism. He just believes in the union. But, no, I mean, no, truth, no, wait a second. Anybody who's followed Keir Starmer for a long time knows this macho posture that he's striking does not come naturally to him. He's scared of the right-wing tabloids. He wants to make sure that the same thing doesn't happen well, to him as happened to Ed Miliband, with uh, Ed well, that's Miliband fair enough because it worked being very, Alex it Salmon's worked, Well, it worked pretty successfully, didn't it? Yes, but it? Nicola Sturgeon is, um, is, is not Alex Salmon. She doesn't frighten the horses south of the border. But it, important to remember, uh, Joe, that Keir Starmer does not need Scotland in order to get the keys of 10 Downing Street. Scottish votes you, have only altered the result of English voters' yeah, decisions you wouldn't twice bring down, you wouldn't bring since down the war. A, you wouldn't bring down a Labour government on any votes, would you? Well, let, let's see how this all plays would out. Would you do that? Well, that's in, in, entirely, um, in, entirely speculative. Well, we, we would expect an intelligent, reasonable discussion with Labour and we want them to stop striking postures. Well, let's, well, let's have an intelligent, reasonable discussion uh, with David Wallace-Lockhart, who was inside the hall there for Nicola Sturgeon's speech. What did you make of it? 
I'll try my best to give you that intelligent reason discussion, Joe. I mean, Always. it took a bit longer than we'd been told it was probably going to take. And I think part of that reason was the amount of applause it got. Mm. It, it certainly went down incredibly well with the, with the audience there. You know, incredibly popular party leader that Nicola Sturgeon is within the SNP, perhaps not to be uh, too surprising. Now, we heard a uh, comparison struck between the UK government, whether that's on taxes, on refugees, on welfare. Mm. And, you know, that's a, that's a distinction that the SNP has liked to draw for some time, uh, saying that they're very different in their approach to government uh, than the UK government. We heard, of course, that little section of the speech focusing on Labour, which many speakers at this SNP conference have done over the course of the weekend. Interesting at a time when the polls UK-wide suggest Labour mm. doing very well. Should be stressed in Scotland, the SNP still very much look to be top of the polls but I think perhaps turning a bit of attention to uh, painting Labour as a bit of a target especially with the the fact that Keir Stammer doesn't want to reverse Brexit something not voted for here in Scotland on the independence question interesting Nicola Sturgeon was encouraging the SNP to speak to people who perhaps aren't already convinced of the case for independence not just talk to themselves also interesting that the SNP now Talking about the economy, which has sometimes in the independence debate been a bit of a, a weaker spot, really focusing on that potentially as a strength now. And I think uh, the economic turmoil we've seen in recent days has mm. perhaps given them a slight opening there. And interesting, Nicola Sturgeon talked about reflecting on the judgment of the Supreme Court if it says that the Scottish Parliament does not have the powers to hold uh, its own independence referendum. She did still stress that there would be some sort of uh, opportunity in a general election for Scots to have a say, but I think we do need a bit more detail on what that's about. A couple of interesting policy announcements as well. Increase in uh, a bridging payment for low-income families over the Christmas period doubled to £260. Two more cancer fast diagnosis, uh, diagnostic centres to be set up in Scotland. And a, a, a topic of much specul speculation in Scotland and beyond. How long will Nicola Sturgeon stay in the job? Well, she certainly said she had no plans to go anywhere anytime soon. And that did get one of the, the biggest rounds of applause. Shows that she is still a very popular leader within our party. Indeed. David Wallace Lockhart, thank you very much there in Aberdeen. Um, David mentions the economy. Yes, it was interesting to set it out as a strength. Um, an independent Scotland uh, would have a thriving economy. Uh, there's going to be a paper on it um, out next week for us all to digest when it has been sort of shaky ground in the past, certainly uh, in the prospectus for the first independence referendum. But what's interesting is that Nicola Sturgeon has said that she would keep the pound. The currency issue was one of those big debates. I mean, when you look at the last few weeks, John, and how they've demonstrated how much the pound, the currency, has been buffeted by the actions arguably, of the UK government, over which you would have no control. Why do you want to keep it? Well, she said that she wants the pound, the, the UK pound, pound sterling, uh, as a transitional currency. She'd set up an independent uh, Scottish bank and she would transition from the UK pound, which we all share, it's our pound as much as England's pound, and we would then move on to a separate uh, Scottish pound. So it's a, not a long-term prospect but a, just a short-term prospect. And then who knows where we go uh, down the road from there. I remember in 2014, people kept using the euro as this great bogey currency that we should be terrified of. Um, that's a possibility. The Scottish pound is, is, is more than a possibility. L let's see how this all plays out. Well, but certainly marshalling of the UK economy by the Tories has been a, a, a disaster. And I think the economy plays to our strength but, now. But in a way, that sort of contradicts everything that's just been set out uh, by Nicola Sturgeon. Why? Either, either there's turmoil um, by being part of sterling, of the currency here, or, or there isn't. And yet you still want to perpetuate it if you believe that turmoil. But just short term. I mean, that's very important to remember. Term is what, Just I, I five years? I don't know. Well, she, she's going to lay out some of this detail, I think, in uh, exactly a week from today when she publishes um, a, a paper specifically on the economy. So let's find out exactly what the proposals are. I haven't seen it, and I'll be interested to, to hear what it says. Were you surprised that she stated very clearly that she will be First Minister for some time to come, or leader of the SNP for some time to come, that she felt the need to say it? No, not, in the, uh, not in the slightest. You saw the reaction that she had there in the hall. And we know that her positive ratings uh, across uh, all parties uh, in Scotland are, are and remain 
uh, towering. She's head and shoulder above all the other party leaders, every one of which has a negative overall rating. She's the only one who doesn't. So it's unsurprising she wants to carry on. And if you were her, would you not want to be the first minister who delivers independence well, and becomes the first 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 Minister of an independent Scotland. And as you say, it's all about the delivery. And of course, we will judge uh, the SNP on exactly that. That's all we have time for today. Thank you very Thank much you. to you, John Nicholson, for keeping me company here in the studio. I'll be back tomorrow with Politics Live at 12.15 here on BBC Two and on the BBC iPlayer. Bye-bye.